Well, good afternoon and welcome to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase, our weekly call in town hall. I'm State Senator Amanda Chase, your weekly radio show host. So the district I serve includes all of Colonial Heights, all of Amelia, and most of Chesterfield. So if you live in those areas, I actually am your state senator. I would also like to thank WNTW 820 AM, The Answer, for the opportunity to provide this free public service to you each week. If you have a question about today's topic, I invite you to call in. I'm going to give you that number in just a minute. But today we are going to continue talking about hot topics and bills that came up during the 2017 legislative session. We will discuss Senate Bill 1398, a bill regarding the disposal of coal ash patroned by Senator Scott Servell, and I also joined him as one of the two patrons on that bill, but this is his mastermind, and um, I signed on a little bit later. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I am a, um, a Christian conservative who just happens to be a Republican, Though I will say I do vote my conscience and do not necessarily follow party lines, I weigh every issue on its own merits and do my best to listen to all stakeholders before forming decisions or drafting policy on issues. I'm also known for not being politically correct. But th one thing I will tell you is that I always seek to tell you the truth, and I'm okay with that. I have no issues with sleeping at night, and my conscience is clear. So um, I'm both a fiscal and a social conservative, but I focus on issues and topics which I feel affect most people in the district and are generally bipartisan in nature, like our topic today regarding electricity and clean water. So let's face it. We all love flipping the light switch and having our lights come on 100% of the time. We also like to swim and canoe in water that's safe and clean. And today we're going to answer the question, is it possible to have both? I certainly hope so, because my kids and I, we like boating and we like swimming. So uh, we're going to be discussing the challenges of keeping the James River clean while meeting the high demand for electricity. And how do we do that with the byproduct coal ash, which the production of electricity creates? So you're going to want to listen intently today, today's broadcast, because I guarantee the topic we are discussing today directly affects you and your family. Okay, now I'm going to give you the number, so get a pen and paper. If you want to write this down, feel free to call in. The number is 804-454-1366, and we're going to do our best to answer your question on the show. If you're shy and you don't want to call in, and I understand there are those of you out there, but you have an issue or concern, feel free to contact my office. Um, I still have office hours each Tuesday and Thursday, even out of session, and you can find my contact information on my website, amandachaseforsenate.com. The purpose of this town hall is to provide constituents an opportunity to learn about what's really going on in their state government. It's not really about politics. It's about issues. It's also an opportunity for me to listen to you and hear what concerns you have so that I can carry those issues back to Richmond. Um, for those of you who are turn, tuning in for the first time, uh, you know, I try to let people know uh, kind of what it means to be a legislator. We're all part-time legislators. We have life outside of the annual winter session. Those of you who are not familiar, um, I am a state senator, not a, I don't work at the federal level in the Senate there in, in D.C. I work at our state's capital in Richmond. And um, we have our active session on the second Wednesday of every January, and it runs 60 days in even years and 45 days in odd years. Personally, I'm a wife, mother of four, and my family owns and has owned various businesses over the years. We're still very busy. Um, four kids, you, you know you're going to be busy, uh, even when we're out of session. But we are our busiest during the winter months when we focus on passing laws. During the rest of the year, we go back to our jobs, our families, but continue to help constituents with issues that come up throughout the year. We also attend many community events, parades, opportunities, uh, meetings to stay in touch with the people that voted us in office. And I just want to add that if you live in the district and you would like for me to come and speak to your group, just give my office a call. I'm happy to do so. Um, and, uh, you know, thankfully... I'm in session, and my heart, the hardest period of time for me are the three months and the winter months. 
which is very different from D.C. Um, I feel sorry for Dave, Congressman Dave Brad and those who work year round to pass federal legislation. Um, I don't have to do that, thankfully. I get to spend more time in my district. So um, I like hanging out with you all a little bit more. No offense. I know Senator Servo, I think, is on the line, too. No offense, Senator Servo. But many of the issues we discuss on Cut to the Chase each week come from meeting with constituents. So we hope that you're going to tune in each Thursday if this is the first time you're tuning in to our weekly town hall to find out what the hot issues are in our area. Okay, so last week we talked about a lot of things, but one of the things that I want to circle back around and talk to about is, is the issue with coal ash. Um, my colleagues and I, we met in Richmond uh, for the past 46 days. As I mentioned earlier, this was a short session. We read, reviewed, discussed, and debated thousands of bills. And the bills that passed both the House and the Senate are now on the governor's desk waiting to be signed. And on Wednesday, April the 5th, we are going to reconvene in Richmond, not D.C., where we have the opportunity to override any governor vetoes with two-thirds of the vote, which will be difficult in the Senate with a 21 to 19 split. 21 Republicans, 19 Democrats. But the governor also has the opportunity to offer his amendments to our bills, and then, of course, the House and the Senate vote up, and, or up or down on those amendments. Today we are discussing the governor's amendments that I am personally waiting to hear back on for Senate Bill 1398, as we mentioned earlier, the bill regarding coal ash. Right now we're still waiting for those amendments by the governor to be finalized. Uh, one thing that we do know for sure is that um, when we re reconvene on Wednesday, April the 5th, which is only a couple of weeks away, we will know more um, about these amendments as we draw closer to that date. I'm sure that the governor staff is right now listening to the stakeholders and getting their input. Stakeholders meaning um, Dominion, the Department of Environmental Quality. We, we're going to shorten that day to DEQ. And they're the state agency whose job is to regulate and hold Dominion accountable for their actions that affect the environment. Um, they're also meeting with legislators like myself, Senator Cervell, um, other folks um, who are interested in this bill, and various envi environmental groups like the James River Association. And speaking of the James River Association, in the studio today I have Jamie Brunkow, who is the Lower James River keeper for the James River Association. Jamie was featured on this past Sunday's Richmond Times Dispatches March 12th edition. And it's great, Jamie, to have you here in the studio today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So let me tell you a little bit about Jamie. First of all, I love, love, love that he's a fellow Hokie. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Biological Sciences from the University of Virginia Tech and, um, a and is currently pursuing a Master's of Natural, Res Natural Resources from Virginia Tech Center for Leadership and Global Sustainability. He's also a native Virginian from Stafford County. And uh, Jamie actually got his start as an environmental educator working with teenage youth and went on to work at Friends of the Rappahannock, leading restoration, education, and advocacy projects aimed at improving the health of the Rappahannock. Jamie has served as the Sassafras River Keeper on the Eastern Shore of Maryland prior to joining the James River Association in 2012. And he's focused his career on water issues and the health of the and of and the health of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. He's been the Lower James River Keeper for the James River Association since 2012, so that's about 5 years. Uh, Jamie, could you please tell us a little bit about your role? at the James River Association. Yeah, of course, and thank you. So we have a, a, about 20 staff at the James River Association that do everything from education to restoration to outreach. But the Riverkeeper program, which I'm a part of, is really focused on pollution, stopping pollution in particular. So that involves taking citizen calls, complaints about fish kills, um, oil spills, any environmental issue you can really imagine encountering on the river. Our job is to go out and document what's happening and to make sure that uh, through working with our partner agencies and uh, regulators, we get those issues addressed and cleaned up. Very good. So, Jamie, as the James River Keeper, how much time do you spend there on the James River, specifically in the area by Dutch Gap and Henricus Park, which is located next to Dominion's Chesterfield Power Plant? Well, I have to unfortunately burst a bubble for a lot of folks. Riverkeeper does sound like somebody who's on the water all of the time. I usually spend about a day a week 
doing field work, and that usually is investigating um, complaints or issues that we, we hear about. Um, but over the last two years, I've spent an awful lot of time at Dutch Gap looking into an issue that we've suspected for some time. Um, we've been very concerned that these ponds, which hold uh, nearly 15 million tons of coal ash, um, are leaking. And we found that uh, other facilities like this one in Chesterfield throughout the southeast are leaking. So our role has really been to get out and to document what's happening there. Okay, now we're going to come back in about 15 seconds. And when we do, Jamie's going to tell us about what changes that he has seen in the river over the last five years. You'll be really interested to hear this. So please stay tuned. We'll be right, we'll be right back. Well, welcome back to Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase. I'm your state senator here and your radio show host once a week. This is our weekly town hall. And, um, you know, I was just talking to Senator Suravel, who's going to be coming on in just a few minutes, um, who is the patron of this bill. And um, this is kind of therapeutic for me. I enjoy coming to the radio station and talking to you all about kind of what's going on in the office all week. And... Um, we're going to bring Senator Serval on in just a minute. I want to finish <clears throat> talking with Jamie. Um, we were talking about uh, changes that he has seen in the river over the past five years. You want to talk a little bit about that, Jamie? Absolutely. Well, I think in a general sense, it's always useful to, to tell folks how much the James River has really improved in terms of its overall health. Um, we can look back, especially for folks who have always lived in Chesterfield County, can probably remember Keep Own Spill and really some low points in the history of the James River. Um, but over the last 40 years, we have seen really just some tremendous improvements in water quality. We're not quite at an A+, and we do have a biannual report card that we release um, from the James River Association, which looks at all kinds of indicators, from, from water quality to the species that live in the river. We're not at an A+, yet, and we still have some really serious issues when we start to look at local level impacts. Um, from industry, from all of the different sectors that really affect um, the, the health of the river. And that's what we're really talking about today are some really localized issues and some, some really legacy pollution from um, the 20th century, from a long time ago. You know, it's interesting. When I was doing my research today, I found out the Department of Environmental Quality just opened its doors in, beginning in 1993. So that's about, I think they're celebrating their 20th anniversary this year. So um, let's talk about that for a minute. So we have across the nation all of these coal ash ponds. And so it's an issue not only Virginia is dealing with, but it's across the states. And um, in Virginia specifically and in specific to Chesterfield, what would you say is your biggest concern right now? Well, we've spent a lot of time over the last few years researching um, what is happening with the coal ash ponds at the Chesterfield Power Station. And our biggest concern right now is, is the future of that site and how the Department of Environmental Quality and how Dominion choose to shut down those ponds. Um, like you said, facilities across the country are, are uh, struggling with this question right now. There's, there's different ways that the state will allow Dominion to shut down these ponds but clearly some will work better than others. And when we have site conditions like we have at Chesterfield that already indicate problems, it, it really deserves a harder look at what we need to protect the river over the long term. Now, in your interview, and we talked about this at the beginning of the show, for those who missed it, um, Jamie was featured on the front page of the Sunday, March 12th edition, this past Sunday, of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. And the title is, I've got it in front of me here, Group insists coal ash ponds pollute the water. Um, you can probably look that up online. But, um, Jamie, they mentioned that you saw what's quote-unquote an unremarkable, unremarkable dribble to the casual eye, but to you it was more like a smoking gun. Would you please tell us what you saw and what, why you were concerned? Yeah, and I take that as a great compliment, an unremarkable um, <laughs> dribble. So that's really what our job is all about, um, finding these kinds of issues. And a lot of times they're right under our nose. Um, so when our site visits to the Dutch Gap Conservation Area, which is a, a public park with lots of trails and boat launches, we hiked along the beach at low tide, 
and in many places you can find these small trickles of water coming out of the bank. In some places they're, they're significantly larger than others, but this is what we call non-tidal flow. It's not influenced by the, the rising tide. It's water seeping out of the bank, coming straight out of, out of, the, uh, out of the earth and into the water. Um, these are sources of pollution. And when you add all of these up, it, it really is a significant impact on the health of, of the area. Um, you know, one particular area, you can, you can see a, a stream and you can see the, the soil has been completely stained red because of that pollution and the iron that is coming to the surface. And I think you called that Red Cove. I think you right. you termed it that. Yeah, it, and it, it's very visually striking. It, it doesn't even really require a site visit to see it. You can you can go on Google Maps and see from the aerial image that it is that stained red color. Now, if in looking at the map here, I can see that there it's a cove, Red Cove, which you actually gave it that name. It's if you were to research it, you would probably not come up with Red Cove, but that's um, a name that you've come up with because, as you said. It's the burnt orange stained mud that's there, um, but it's a cove located between the lower and the upper coal ash ponds, um, and that burnt orange stained mud there is actually the product of iron seeping out of Dominion Virginia Power's neighboring coal ash ponds into groundwater, as you were mentioning, and flowing up into the cove. The uh, Richmond Times-Dispatch article also mentions that levels of arsenic were at quote-unquote off-the-chart concentration. Is there any possibility any possibility that this iron could be from another source? That's a great question, and it's important to acknowledge that this is a an area that has a lot of a lot of history. There was a sand and gravel mine there. There's been lots of uses of that particular section of the river for many years. But uh, one of the things that we did when we collected these water samples is we did something called a boron isotope test, also known as a fingerprint test. So there is a way to look at boron in the water sample to look at what species of boron you have and to assign that to its source. And what we found is that it is related to coal. So we have the, the high arsenic, we have the other metals that we found in the water, but we also have this, this fingerprinting test that really points directly to the coal ash ponds. Well, let's talk about in the, in the Agriculture House Subcommittee and the full committees, there was a difference in opinion about whether or not, quote unquote, harmful concentrations of heavy metals are leaving the ash sites. And in fact, the director of the DEQ stated that they were not harmful concentrations of heavy metals leaving the sites according to their regular testing. However, in Chesterfield, both your organization, the James River Association, and a Duke University-led team both found contamination, which was, I mentioned that, um, any idea why the DEQ is not finding contamination, but the James River Association and the Duke team are? As soon as we had these results, we shared them with the Department of Environmental Quality. We've sat down, and we've met with officials from the department, and what we've found is sort of a fundamental um, lack of, of uh, alignment in how we address pollution and how the state assesses its waters. Um, the state has a list of criteria that have been set in the code they measure a sample of water in the middle of the river, and they compare those results to those, those uh, measurements, to the, um, the table of, of water quality standards. We're not trying to do that. We are trying to show that there are leaks, that there is pollution originating from the coal ash ponds. It is getting off-site. Each one of these samples was off-site from the Dominion property, and uh, each of the concentrations were at levels that are harmful, and especially when we're talking about this stuff building up in soil over several decades, going back to the mid 20th century. Um, there's no healthy amount of lead or arsenic. This is a, a real concern for people and for the environment. I know that one of the issues that DEQ brought up was the methodology in which the tests were done by the, D, uh, that's different from the DEQ. Uh, they're saying that the Duke University studies and that your studies were different. Can you talk specifically about that. When we, I guess we have 15 seconds, so we'll come back in a minute. Happy to when we We're get also going to meet Senator Cervell. Stay tuned. This is State Senator Amanda Chase here in the studio with Jamie Brunkow, who's the Lower James River Keeper for the James River Association. 
Jamie, again, I thank you so much for coming in today. And if you haven't seen the article, he's on the front page of the Times Dispatch, Sunday, March 12th edition. Go back and check out this article. Um, one of the things that we were talking about is the methodology. We had three tests that were done testing the water quality. Um, and uh, let's just talk a little bit about that because I know the DEQ was saying that the methodology was different from what you did from their test. Explain that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing we, we started to, to talk about before the break is that the state has something called water quality standards. And uh, this, is, this is really a set of, of standards for things like oxygen in the water, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and all kinds of chemicals that can really affect the health of the river. And these criteria help the agency to determine whether the, the river is okay for fishing, swimming, boating, and it all, all of that goes back to the Clean Water Act, which is what we use to regulate um, pollution all over the country. But there is a, a difference between that sort of assessment and the assessment that we've done at Chesterfield. Um, the places that we've collected these samples, again, are in really small bodies of water at the heads of coves, like Red Cove, where we really are just seeing um, small, small amounts of flow from the bank, really groundwater-driven, um, non-tidal flow. And this is where we've found the, uh, the water loaded with, with pollutants, with heavy metals. And there are not state criteria where you can look at a table and, and compare those. So they really are different, different methodologies, different types of assessment. But I think the point that we may be missing in getting caught up in that discussion about methodologies is that this is really pollution. That's the point of this. It's to, to document pollution unless Dominion or any other utility or, or industry has a a state permit to discharge pollution. It's against the law, and that goes right back again to the Clean Water Act. Very good. And, you know, I um, am really excited. I, I called Senator Cervell uh, a little bit ago. Um, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction. I, and, Senator Cervell, are you still there? Hi. Senator Cervell, still there? Can you hear me? Hi, um, I can hear you. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. We've been uh, talking about having you on here for quite some time. Uh, Senator Cervell is one of my seatmates in the Virginia Senate. He serves the 36th district and um, even served in the House of Delegates. And he actually uh, graduated from James Madison University, where my daughter attends. And I went to law school at University of Virginia. And I won't hold that against him because he's, he's actually, um, <laughs> he, he represents um, Portions of Fairfax, Prince William, and Stafford County were friendly rivals, both on our college teams and in the Senate. Um, I, as a Republican, he is a Democrat, and he has just um, been phenomenal to work with on this bill. And I uh, just appreciate so much his expertise. Um, Senator Cervell, you have um, spent a lot of time, effort, and energy um, in talking about um, some issues that you've had at, at Possum Point and um, let's talk a little bit about the EPA's mandate for utilities to close their coal ash ponds by 2020. Um, I know that during the hearing that you and I both spoke at, um, they were talking about how the uh, Department of Environmental Quality felt like they were in a box because they had to meet the EPA's mandate to close the coal ash ponds. But at the same time, um, you know, we were asking them to do this study that was going to require another year. So. Can you inform our listeners a little bit about that mandate? Sure, and, and Amanda, thanks for having me um, on your show, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to your constituents and folks in, in the Richmond suburbs there about the problem, because it's, it's a statewide problem, and your all's problem is mainly focused around the uh, Chesterfield site and then the Bremo plant, which is upriver a bit, and um, up in northern Virginia, we've got this Possum Point plant, and um, the EPA the EPA piece was all, it all started when um, there was a couple of dam breaks. The first, the big one, was in Tennessee. Uh, it's the, it was called the Kingston spill, and uh, it was about five years ago. If you go, or actually it's about, I think it was actually about eight years ago now, but if you go Google it, basically they had a massive coal ash pond spill up in Tennessee, and it spoiled two different rivers and created an EPA Superfund site with all the coal ash that poured into a river, a river up there. And um, that still sort of got e e woke EPA up, and EPA said, you know what, maybe it's not a good idea that we store all this toxic uh, coal ash and the water that it sets in in a, in a pond where, you know, it could escape. 
And sure enough, while EPA was trying to figure out what rules to implement, we had another spill right on the Virginia border into the Dan River, and that whole coal ash spill, all that stuff went flowing into the Dan River. It came into Virginia, ruined a bunch of drinking water for Virginians down south side near Danville, um, Prince Edward County down there, and then went back into, back into North Carolina while the rule was pending. And that, that caused EPA to come to hurry things up, and they basically said that we're not going to allow utilities to store this stuff in ponds anymore. Stay tuned. We're going to be right back with Senator Cervell. Stay tuned. We're back. This is State Senator Amanda Chase. And on the phone with me, I have State Senator Scott Servell. And um, Senator Servell, thanks again for joining us. And uh, we got cut off there for a second. And um, we want to we want to go back to what we were talking about, which is how do we meet? How do how does the how does Dominion comply with the federal mandate to meet the deadline by 2020 and, and comply with state and federal law? Well, um, Amanda, you know, the EPA has basically said that you got to you got to get this stuff out of the water and you got to do something with it. So basically, what we have to do is we have to drain all these ponds, which means we got to get all this toxic water out somehow. It has to be either treated or discharged or something. And then once we have all that slushy, wet ash left, we have to either dig it up and haul it away, which is called clean closure, or we have to um, put a cap on it. They put like a rubber a rubber seal on top of it and dump a bunch of dirt on top. That's called uh, cap in place, or in some states, um, you can actually they're actually digging it up and recycling it and turning it into products like concrete or uh, railroad ties or uh, crossbars on utility poles, things like that. So we basically have to do something to get out of the water and, and permanently deal with it besides just letting it sit there in the water forever. And EPA has given, given um, the states a period of time and utilities a period of time to to sort through this because every site is different. Possum Point is different from Chesterfield, which is different from Bremo, which is different from the Elizabeth River site down in Chesapeake, Virginia, which is crazy. That site down there is absolutely insane, the things that are going on down there. And so we have we have time to sort it out. And um, <clears throat> that's what our bill this session did. The bill this session basically said, you know, let's let's take a time out, let's look at all this very carefully, put the information out there, and then make the right decision. Because one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that whenever your utility company does something, whether it builds a new a new coal plant or a gas plant or a power plant or puts up power lines, you end up paying for it through your utility bill because the utility company, because it's a monopoly, is allowed to recover that cost in your rates. And so, you know, the state of Virginia, we regulate them through the State Corporation Commission, and it's, it's important that we do this right because if Dominion, they're saying, Dominion's saying they're going to have to spend like, between half a billion dollars and three billion dollars to fix this, and you know, I think, we, we, I think the, the two of us and, we, and a lot of us think that it's important that we do this right from the very beginning. Right, and that's something that you and I have been lockstep in on this bill and discussing in these committees before the committees and the subcommittees. And I explained to folks that we passed this out of the Senate and um, passed it out of the House, but the House put in an amendment. And which pretty much gutted the bill and said that Dominion could go ahead and continue to cap and seal this in place, not excavate, but cap and seal it in place simultaneously while they're also doing the study. And we were we were both saying, wait a minute, why would you do that? Because that could end up causing the rate payer to have to pay twice instead of just once. So um you know, that that is where we are with this right now. Now, um, you know, right now, uh, Senator Cervell and I have been uh, meeting and talking with the governor's staff and working on amendments to return this bill back to its original state that it passed out of the Senate, um, in which there was still a public comment period, because if I remember Senator Cervell, they, they took that out. Um, so we right. Um, That was one of the things they took out. And then also, uh, again, the simultaneously being able to cap and seal um, as opposed to, um, you know, doing this, doing the study. Uh, They wanted they didn't want to wait. They wanted we're we're requiring a one year cooling off period. And uh, 
So that didn't make any sense to either one of us. So we're hoping that the governor will come back with amendments that restore the bill to its original form that would allow them to, to not cap and seal until the study is done, until we can fully evaluate all the effects of this situation. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, half a billion dollars or three billion dollars is a lot of other people's money to spend, and we we just want to make sure that that they're doing the right thing before they start making those kinds of investments uh, in the in this process. Because you know, Virginia ratepayers are the ones that are going to have to pay for it at the end of the day. That's exactly right. You know, I had um, several questions that came in this week, and I want to address those. Um, one retired Dominion employee and constituent asked if the coal ash ponds were online because Dominion was not in compliance with with law at the time, or did this become an issue later mm-hmm. on? And the answer to that question is that while we've had electricity produced at this Chesterfield Power Plant for almost 50 years, the DEQ, as I mentioned earlier, didn't even open their doors until April 1st of 1993. So they are getting ready to celebrate 20 years, but the coal ash ponds were largely unregulated for many years. Um, the second question people are asking me, well, is who who pays for this cleanup? Is it Dominion that's going to pay for that? Well, just as Senator Servell says, no, it's actually the State Corporation Commission allows Dominion to recoup this cost to you, the rate payer, which is why Senator Servell and I have been so insistent on making sure that an appropriate evaluation is done before we go to the expense of capping and sealing the coal ash ponds in place. Um, let's just talk about the process and kind of explain, uh, to folks, you know, one of the things that we've talked about other states and what they do, we've talked about Georgia, we've talked about South Carolina and North Carolina. They are not capping and sealing in in place. They are excavating the coal ash. And in fact, they're sending in North Carolina as we speak, they are, uh, sending that coal ash to Amelia County, the other part of my district to, um, waste management there in a lined it's a controlled lined uh, it's it's everything is good that's that's what you want it you want a lined facility that's uh that's being monitored and so north carolina is sending their coal ash here um which it which hmm, i i hope we get a grip on this and and take some uh some action very quickly so that that coal ash line facility doesn't fill up before we we have the need of using it Senator Servell, is there anything else that you would like to add about the, the governor's amendments, um, any prospects, what you seek? Maybe tell the folks um, specifics about this bill that you would want to add. No, I'm, Well, I'm hopeful that the governor will add a one-year moratorium back into the bill so that we have time to get the information back and act on it before, uh, before significant money has started to be spent, either, you know, excavating or capping or whatever. I mean, I think Dominion would like to just leave all this stuff where it is in these sort of semi or unlined ponds and uh, put a cap on it and let it sit there. And, you know, up in my district, in the Possum Point site, Dominion has agreed to hook up over a dozen people in homes who live near these live near the pond to public water because they have found that their their wells are polluted with lead and a lot of other stuff. So I'm That's hopeful bad. the governor make the amendment. Well, let's hope so. We'll have Senator Sorrell back on in weeks to come. Thanks so much for coming on our show today. We're back for the final wrap-up of Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase, and I'm State Senator Amanda Chase, and um, I really appreciate you tuning in today. I hope you found today's information insightful and again, um, so you know, so we're talking about what do we do with these football fields worth of coal ash? Do we simply leave it in place, cap it and seal it in place? The cost to seal in place was roughly about $1.5 million. Uh, that's the cost for simply leaving the coal ash in the ground, capping the mound with a thick synthetic plastic like material, and covering the ash. You know, I think the thing that concerns me the most is that we're talking about specifically to the Chesterfield location is that it's not lined. It's sitting in the former channel of the James River. We have discrepancies in the, in the in the testing of the water quality. And so I just think that we don't have all the information that we need. This is my personal opinion uh, to uh, to I don't I don't know that capping and sealing is the right thing to do at this point. I want to see some more um, studies done to before we spend the tax pay, before the rate before we spend the ratepayers money 
to go ahead and cap and seal this in place. I want to make sure this is the right option right now. And so um, I really am hopeful that the governor will put in those amendments uh, that would allow us to study this before we do any type of action. And I just want to emphasize, this is a bill about studying and evaluation. Um, I have a background in finance, and I don't like to waste money. <laughs> a lot of people are surprised um, to find out that there are Republicans that do care about in the environment. Um, I do care about the environment. I think we're supposed to be good stewards of the um, the land God gave us, and um, we've got it. We've got to take care of it. So, um, you know, we talked about alternative options in Chesterfield. I am looking at excavating the coal ash and um, finding out the cost of how much it would be to rail that out. So uh, we're we're figuring it out. We know it's going to be over three billion dollars. Um, that would be uh, could possibly be a four percent increase. But we just we need some more information. So stay tuned each week, every Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m. as we strive to address issues that are important to you. We'll be talking about coal ash again. We're going to hopefully bring uh, Jamie Bronkow. I so much appreciate him coming on the show today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. It's it's not very. It's great that we have the star of the Richmond Times-Dispatch's Sunday paper here in the studio with us today. And certainly want to thank Senator, Senator Surabell, who in the Senate, in my opinion, is probably one of the leading experts on coal ash and um, it's an honor to, to uh, join in this effort to uh, try to make the best decision possible and make sure that we do it the right way. So if you would like to receive notices of upcoming events, town halls, or my weekly newsletter, I want you to visit my website, amandachaseforsenate.com. Go and sign up there. Uh, during session, I send a weekly update each Friday, and out of session, we send out a monthly newsletter. Or you can always join us each Thursday on our weekly town hall here at WNTW AM 820. The answer on Cut to the Chase with Senator Chase. Until next week, we hope you will tune in. Stay tuned. We have more exciting legislative updates coming up from now through April the 5th. Stay tuned.